Amanda to tell us that it's okay to go ahead because she's got the recording going. We are live now, Chair. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the meeting of the MHAC committee. Um, I now call the meeting to order. Uh, the first order of business is um, a motion that the Museum and Heritage Committee approve the agenda as circulated or as amended. May I have a motion? Colleen, mm -hmm. second. I'll second. Okay, is that Emmett? Okay, thank you. Um, are there any discussion? Uh, I just have, I have I have one item and it, it, it has to do with item six, uh, no, not 6.2. Um, I guess it's uh, the number 6.2, the um, owner incentives for designation. The idea was that that would eventually, that would be posted on the municipal website, but I just want to know for sure, and maybe when we get to that session, we do it. Do we need a special motion for that recommendation to post it or be, once it's approved by MHAC, can I just take that straight to Amanda uh, for the website? And I just don't know how the how putting things on the website works because I've never tried to put anything like that on before. Amanda? Um, at this point, we're just approving the agenda. That is a motion that can come from forward from the committee when we get to that item number. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so I, are there any uh, further questions, uh, Emmett? Uh, I did have a question just uh, about item 6.3, whether there was any supporting documentation of that or whether this is going to be well, when we get to that it's actually I, I have a, i have some verbal stuff to report from heritage ontario but it's more of a discussion at this point about what we as gray highlands heritage and museum think we can or should do going forward to promote that so maybe we could discuss that when we get to that item if that's okay thank you yep okay um okay if there's no further um uh, discussion uh, can all in favor of accepting the agenda as written? Aye. In favor. Okay, thank you. All right. That's good. Um, are, is there a declaration of pecuniary interest regarding any of the items on the agenda? Does not appear so. Thank you. Uh, adoption of the minutes. Um, that the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee approved the minutes of 2021-08.9 as presented. Could I have a motion to that effect? Stewart, seconded. Uh, Mayor McQueen, thank you. Um, any discussion? I have one item of correction, Amanda, and it's minor, but in those items, item 6.2 regarding the community sign, Heron's Hollow is, a, is um, a spelling error. Heron's only has one R in it. And uh, so probably those minutes should be corrected to reflect that so that we don't get another misspelled sign on the, on, on the, the roads of Gray Highlands. Port law is sufficient. <laughs> Do I need a motion to make that change or is that? The mover and seconder should identify as being friendly or not. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say that's a housekeeping item. I can just, a, a spelling it. mistake, I can just fix. Okay. Thank you very much. It was my spelling mistake. It wasn't yours. I. So if you can fix that, awesome. So uh, is there any further discussion about those minutes? All in favor of accepting the minutes as uh, corrected? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Subcommittee rec um, minutes, the recommendation that the committee receive the following subcommittee meetings for information, Heritage Gray Highlands 2021-1026, South Korea Museum Board minutes for July, August, and September of 2021, and those minutes were all attached. Um, is there any comment or discussion on any of those minutes? Oh, sorry. Could I have a motion that we accept those minutes? Yes. So um, Colleen, seconded. Did you second that, Emmett? That's that's great. Any discussion on any of those um, attached minutes? 
Uh, there being none, may I have a vote to accept the minutes as uh, circulated? Okay. okay. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now, now we get to the interesting parts. Uh, item 6.1. Um, introduction of Museum and Heritage Curator Peter Whitehead. Put up your hand, Peter, for those of you who haven't met Peter. Um, and now, do we need, do we need, we don't need it, we can't, Peter already is the museum, so is this just open for discussion for Peter to introduce himself and talk about his policies? Okay, so I'm going to turn, I'm going to mute myself, which will probably make everybody happy and turn the floor over to Peter. Um, it's all yours, sir. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna just share my screen here. So does everybody see that okay? Perfect. So this is gonna be somewhat repetitive some, for some of our board members that are also in this meeting, but it's kind of a, a quick introduction to my background um, what I've kind of discovered of the museum in the first kind of month and a half and, and a direction to move forward. So um, incredibly honored to be uh, taking part in the uh, storytelling here at the South Gray Museum. Uh, my background is uh, deeply in storytelling. So I have a 20 year uh, advertising background where I worked in Toronto. So it is uh, all about learning to, uh, to, to lie and all those terrible things that advertising people do, but it's, uh, it's a really great background in telling short stories, um, not only in uh, television, but also in print. And that led to a secondary career in filmmaking where I worked on documentary film um, specifically for um, about five years. And that weirdly transitioned uh, into a visit to uh, the Walt Disney Hometown Museum in uh, Marceline, Missouri, where uh, during my visit found out that they were hiring a, uh, a curator, a museum director, and I put my hand up as a Disney fan and um, somehow made that happen. And I've just come back from a seven year stint in Missouri, where we were running this 10,000 square foot museum uh, dedicated to the story of Walt Disney. Uh, and really the, the, the big, tie in with all those is storytelling. I think everyone is a facet of how you tell a story. It's just, if it's dimensional or if it's in film or if it's in print, some of the things that we did in the museum, uh, it's again, 10,000 square feet in the heart of Marceline in an old 1913 Santa Fe railway station. Uh, what I learned after discussions with the Disney company as we move forward to try to um, tell new stories within our museum is the importance of presentation for sure. Uh, the one thing that, that, that you'll see here in this Ruth Disney gallery, uh, Ruth Disney is Walt's uh, sister. She gave us about 4,000 artifacts to tell the story of the Disney family in Marceline. She thought it was incredibly important to keep that story alive and vibrant. Uh, that is a television that Walt bought for his sister to watch the opening of Disneyland because she didn't want to travel and she didn't like crowds. So she, she didn't have a television at the time. So Walt sent her money uh, she kept that television uh, in the back of her garage forever, and it used to just sit out front. Um, and now it's in a in a box, a plexiglass box, and it's specifically in a box after a discussion with the Disney archives. Uh, the head of the Disney archives, literally, and again, I, I repeated this story in our um, in our museum board meeting. But as we were sitting at the table at Disney, she pulled her shoes off and she put her shoes on the boardroom table and said, uh, right now, this is just a pair of shoes. And then she went and got a, a box and put it over her shoes and said, now this is a gallery display. Uh, it is important how you present your pieces uh, to show the respect that they deserve. And so uh, we did that in the museum. Um, so building cases for pieces, designing moments in time. So we had 10,000 square feet. It was uh, traditional to spend anywhere between two and three hours in our museum, wandering through and taking in stories. Uh, my worry in the museum that we're in here now, we're gonna talk about square footage and things in, in a little bit, but it's a, it's a very small space. So we still have to design to me moments in time uh, to pause, to have people take in a deeper story, whether it's through video, but there's so many mediums that we can um, touch on now 
to make people pause a little bit longer. And it's not, we're, we're not only going to be talking to people that live in, uh, in Gray Highlands, it's the people that move through Gray Highlands and the importance of our stories. And by keeping them a little bit longer in the museum, it's going to benefit all of uh, the, the restaurants and the other shops in this area. We want them to stay as long as humanly possible uh, in Gray Highlands and spend their money here. So we're going to design spaces to make people pause, spend more time in the museum. Uh, we're going to be inviting artists, as we already do, to, to share their uh, expertise. Uh, this is uh, at the back, the piece of Walt is done by a gentleman named uh, Arcee. Uh, and he did that in eight hours in spray paint on our main street in Marceline when we were there. And it was so beautiful that we brought it into the museum. It was designed to be uh, shown externally, but we brought it inside. Uh, and it is surrounded by a handmade display of Disneyland made by a gentleman named Dale Varner, who spent about 40 years making it absolutely, absolutely to scale. Uh, Walt at some point gave him the blueprints to the Magic Kingdom, and he started to build each piece individually by hand. Took him his entire life. It's a beautiful piece of folk art, um, beautifully displayed in the museum. And the one thing that we were about to do and that we're going to make sure that we do here is uh, our museum in, in the United States was uh, fully integrated for wheelchair access. Um, some of those display cabinets, so those beautiful pieces were a little bit high. And if you're in a wheelchair, you had trouble seeing them. So we were about to institute photos of what you would see if you can't see it and a little description below. So that's the thing that's really important in this museum as well is to make sure that we're accessible to everyone um, stories and uh, displays. The other thing that we had privy to and access is the original 45 acre Disney farm. So on that farm, we not only had signage, we had a reproduction of Walt's uh, original barn. It was taken from Walt's blueprints that uh, he had made to make a display for his train. It's a, in his Homeby Hills property, he actually had a working train behind his house and he wanted a place to work on it. So he built a tool shed from his memories of the barn in Marceline. So we recreated those using those same blueprints. Um, brought in signage, and we were again about to introduce QR codes throughout the community, as well as the farm, because almost everybody, not everybody, but almost everybody has um, access to a smartphone so they can wander through and hit a QR code and hear a much more in-depth story than what you provide at any given time. So it can be video, audio links, and that is certainly something that I hope that we will be able to achieve here is have our museum as a base for telling stories in Gray Highland, but literally use all of Gray Highland to be our museum. So we will um, use QR codes to tell stories and direct those people back to this museum to hear more about those stories. So it's all about expansion um, and signage. And it's, it's all about, we talked about it in our board meeting this morning. We are about to undergo a, um, a usage catalog. I mean, we're going to do a booklet on literally how to run this museum moving forward, including signage usage. Um, it's just really important that whenever we don't have the ability to share our logo or our font or anything, that there's a commonality to it moving forward. So we're about to create a, a whole uh, kit for people in the future to use. So when we now start talking about specifically uh, the South Gray Museum, this is essentially what we have right now. Uh, we have roughly 1,782 square feet of usable space. Um, part of that is our archive, our archive collection, our office space and mechanical space. But we have a little over 1,100 um, square feet of public space. And it's uh, interestingly used right now. There was a, a specific movement to make it more of a meeting place as opposed to a museum, but it is going to revert back to very specifically being a museum. I think that is the core strength of, of this space and it, it should be its pure and simple purpose is to tell some really amazing stories of some outstanding people that call Gray Highlands home. So we are going to um, make sure that every square inch that we can gets dedicated to telling stories. And um, we are going to uh, most likely move whatever is left over from archival uh, collection into a different space. We're not going to house it in our museum space. Uh, we don't have 
uh, you know, although there's a, a, a curator, I, I would point to Gray uh, Roots Museum as having a manager, uh, an archivist specifically and a curator, and they all do very specific things. Uh, it would be silly to think that we have the capability or the strength to properly uh, house and archive uh, collections. So there are other people that do it better than we will. So we will let them partner with us doing that and we will utilize our space to tell stories. So literally in our main gallery space, uh, I've proposed that we build what I call H walls. So it is giving us linear feet of display space. So we are such a small tight space anyway uh, I want you to be able to wander through and flow in a comfortable manner. Uh, every seemingly um, access space or hallway is at least six feet wide, so you don't feel like you're cramped. I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable if there's someone else in the museum. And I hope going forward that we have lots of people in the museum, so I don't want people uh, uncomfortable. But again, it gives us a 68 square or feet, linear feet of display walls. It gives us the ability to do a blueprint for lighting and for audio and video in the future. So right now we just have kind of a, we have a stage. Uh, we have some pieces around the wall, but we don't have lighting that specifically highlights um, a specific piece or a gallery display. And that's incredibly important. Uh, if you see in this next slide, this is just something that was found online, but it almost echoes the H wall concept, which gives little cubby holes to tell very specific stories, uh, allows you to light it very dramatically and even add sound to very specific limited areas. So um, I think that will be the blueprint and the hope uh, moving forward that we start to utilize a space component that looks like that. And then the stories that we tell are the big thing right now. That is what our board is thinking over. Um, but uh, I've proposed at the beginning that we tell the story of Grey Highlands. It's a, it, I don't think a story that we've told in great detail here in the past, but we are talking to people other than just people from Grey Highland again. So I want them to come in and understand the amalgamation, why the, our community is important, uh, the little towns that, that make our community and the highlights of those communities. Uh, we'll talk about indigenous history. I uh, will talk about black history, uh, agriculture, uh, railway history, uh, education, community stories. And the community stories is the one thing that will constantly change, I hope, within this museum. And it's the way that we'll reach out. Uh, right now, our, our last curator, Rob, did a lot of work going out into our community and interviewing people and understanding the importance of this community and the people within it, but we didn't have anywhere to showcase it uh, in our museum. And that is the place where we'll do that. And what I'm hoping is not only that families will feel uh, honored to have their heritage told in our museum, but the people that don't have their story told will wander in and say, I want to share my story here too and reach out uh, in great detail about why their story should be share, shared here. So that community stories area will change every year um, uh, and maybe multiple times during the course of the year. So we'll stay. It's all about, I've come to visit. Why should I come back? You're going to come back because stories will constantly be changing within this museum. Uh, Agnes McPhail is a great place to hang our hat. She is one of the most important parts of our story. So I would say that we dedicate um, not only a lot of square footage to telling Agnes's story, but the one thing that I think is vitally important to this museum or any museum is having the one piece in your gallery display that when people wander in, either they've come for a specific reason or they just have found you, they need to leave the museum saying, wow, I cannot believe that I just saw that in that little museum. So to that point, I'm hoping to recreate Agnes's uh, MP office in our museum. So we've already discussed, uh, I've reached out to Heritage Canada. Uh, I have um, luckily friends uh, who work in that department and uh, I will be going to Ottawa in the next little bit to, to dig a little deeper, find out where Agnes's office was, literally what was the view out of her window. And I hope that she had a window. My wife said, I bet you they didn't even give her an office with a window, but Hopefully she did. So um, we are going to, as uh, honestly as we can, with uh, the budget that we will have, 
showcase Agnes's office. This will be our wow moment, I hope. So this will be the one place that people come in, see, experience, wander away and say, you must, 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 must go and visit this museum. So uh, we will hang our hat around there. The next gallery space, I'm calling it Chris Neal. And I say that only because we've just dedicated in Flusherton uh, an arena to his name, but it's deeper than that. Um, I would say it's more of an inspirational gallery. So I would love to interview Chris. I would love to, for him to tell families, kids, that you can live anywhere on this planet. And if you're willing to dedicate yourself through hard work or perseverance or skill, you can be an inspiration to others. So um, the fact that he had a really successful NHL career for so long, I want that to inspire kids in our area. And we are gonna be talking to families, not just adults. So within that space, I'd like to recreate a little bit of the rink. Uh, and I know that those pieces exist, so we don't have to recreate them. Uh, there's old dasher boards, um, set up an old space. I would love to have some of the old uh, jerseys hanging up there as a photo opportunity. And then again, in the future, and it might not be now, but it might be in the future, I would love to have a place where kids can come and shoot on net. Um, it, it's, it's one of those moments, again, I want families to leave this space uh, uh, just full of surprises, uh, answered or unanswered. But um, I want to celebrate uh, local businesses like Chapman's. Uh, not only, um, well, I just think they're an incredibly important story. They're a success story from our neighborhood. So, um, so we should be celebrating people who have uh, made an international or a national uh, footprint in this community, uh, as well as Ice River Springs. Um, I would love to approach them because they're doing such amazing things with recycling. They are an inspirational story onto their own. So there is value in partnering with our, those people that are in our community that share a, a much bigger story. And we will be doing those um, initially, uh, you know, dimensionally, two-dimensionally on the walls. We don't have, again, the blessing of size in this space. So we have to be careful about not protruding from the wall too deeply. But you can tell incredibly detailed and beautiful and warm stories, uh, even if it is in a two-dimensional way. And as we progress and potentially build on and add stories, we have these beautiful cases. We just brought one back from the Kinplex and put new locks on it and all that fun stuff. But we're kind of reclaiming uh, all of the cases that we have that are spread all around uh, Gray Highlands and bringing them back to the museum, if nothing more than to understand what we have in this space. Um, and then as we, again, progress, this is a great example of how they use plinths um, to display pieces. People are pretty respectful. Usually if something's on a, on a big, large uh, plinth or a, a raised display, they don't tend to step on it or walk on it. And if you're with the kid, you hopefully hold your child's hand uh, carefully, but it's a more dimensional way of telling stories. And I suspect at some point uh, we'll get into the, you know, the whole beautiful detailed, I suspect this is in the Smithsonian Institute myself, but uh, I love the use of the glass cases, the displays, the lighting, the color. Um, what I hope that we're going to do uh, in the next few months, because uh, we are hoping to reopen next spring, is to make an incredibly vibrant, a story-filled space that no matter who you are, you will walk into this museum and understand this community far, far better. If you live in this community, uh, embrace your stories and invite you to share your stories within our community. Uh, and for uh, the next lucky curator that comes by, if I uh, get hit by a bus or uh, something terrible happens, can step in immediately into this space and understand our stories by just visiting our museum and be able to push them even further in the future. So we have a pretty limited budget to start. But um, I have uh, this crazy imagination that sometimes goes beyond a budget. So we will just fight to do something incredibly precious and special uh, within our space. So it's all about building a strong museum foundation and layering off of that school outreach, community outreach, become self-sustaining. So I'd like to have a, a vibrant store within this museum that sells online as well. Um, 
And I'd like to push it to guided tours at some point. We did guided tours in our last museum, even at 10,000 square feet. People paid a premium to wander through with a curator, for instance, to see and hear those stories firsthand. So um, I'm hoping that within the next year, at least, we have some sort of a plan to even monetize the museum so that we can know that every year we are set and in place to grow our story further and further. So that is a, uh, as, as hopefully unboring and quick version of uh, our visioning for the museum in the near future. Yeah, we're pretty excited about where we can go um, and the growth potential and our story potential. I, I think we're all pretty excited. So that's, uh, that's, where, we're, that's where we're heading. And everyone's I'm, falling asleep now. I'm, I'm Bob Smith. That I, I've been in museums all over the world because, as most of you know, I'm, I was a world traveler for my living. And uh, I, I, your ideas are just stellar. Um, I, I, I've got one crazy suggestion. I don't know if you know it. Have you been in the Sir John Soane Museum in London? It's at Lincoln's Inn Field. No. He was a collector, and he and he his whole house is a museum. buildings in the world he collected Turner was his best friend so he had all these Turner paint not Turner he has Turner paintings and who at Hogarth all kinds of Hogarth pictures and they were big and they took up space and he developed this folding fan kind of thing and it just kept turning on itself and turning on itself and it didn't take up any space it was flat against a wall but I'm thinking if you want changing displays you've kind of got patron activated changing displays with some kind of a system like that and it was just what what occurred to me when i was seeing your small space big idea concept sure yeah no yeah that's that's great uh what i'm going to be doing is visiting uh, more and more museums in this area i want to see how they tell their stories there's always uh potential for uh new learning and growth by just literally wandering around and seeing how other people tell their stories I just think there's something strong about coming off um, in the most professional way that we can. Uh, this museum in Marceline that I just came from had, when I got there, lots of handwritten notes and all those things, which are adorable, but um, there's a certain level of expectation that I want to achieve with this precious little museum. Uh, and as we learn our story, our board uh, and the people that are on this phone call um, are going to be incredibly important in um, not only shaping what stories we tell in this museum, but what those stories are. Because uh, for my, my work in documentary filmmaking, the thing that you'll take when you watch a film is only what I give you. So I can take a very specific direction to tell a documentary. It won't tell the whole story. It'll just tell you the story that I want to tell you. So there's lots of ways to move through this museum and lots of stories and lots of ways those stories could move. It's not that they're inflexible and we can continue to grow, but uh, I just think it's, in, it's invaluable when this museum space was built, um, as Stuart said in one of our um, very first meetings, purpose-based to be a museum, uh, we have to get right back to our roots. We have to be that, we just have to be a gem. And, and I think we can. Great. I don't know about anybody else on the committee, but because of all the knowledge I have in doing research for heritage buildings, which is my role, I would ha be happy to partner on some of the storytelling because I know where some of the bodies are buried. <laughs> anybody else have anything they want to discuss with Peter? Okay, I think that's good. Now I'm going to get my agenda back. There we go. Um, I, I I don't think we need any kind of emotion except to, I'd certainly like to add my thanks for what you've done in a month and a half is amazing. And I look forward to seeing what happens in the future. And I'm sure Colleen feels much the same, yes? <laughs> Did you have something to say on it? No, you're just, you're just saying thumbs up. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so I'm gonna move on to item 6.2 owner incentives for designation. Uh, you were, oh, sorry, go ahead, Amanda. Is there something I need to do? I'm, I'm not gonna... No, that's fine. Um, if we could just do a motion to receive um, the introduction for information, that's all. 
I'm, I'm not allowed to make motions. No. Who would like to move that? Uh, Colleen uh, will move them and uh, second it. Yep. I'll second it. Um, Elizabeth, thank you very much. And all in favor? I think that's a huge, enthusiastic, unanimous yes. <laughs> okay. So now we go on to owner incentives for designation. Um, that the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee receive the owner incentives for heritage designation documents for information. And that the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee approve the document in substantially the same form as attached here too. Uh, may I have a motion to that effect? I will move the first part okay. of the motion to receive okay. as information, thanks. Okay, uh, okay, so that, that so, so we should do it in two parts, okay? So yeah, you're probably right, Emma, thank you. So the first part that, that we're motioning now is that you receive this for information. That's moved by Emmett, seconded by uh, Stuart. Uh, now, is there any discussion of the content? Does anybody want me to put it up on screen share or did you have a chance to go through it? Um, if you'd like a little background on the information that's there, that has all been very carefully vetted. Um, I've run it by CHO. In fact, the town of Cornwall actually asked me as one of, part of my role on the CHO board to recreate a very similar document with all the same information for their heritage, municipal heritage website. And basically it was the same information, but the pictures are swapped out with pictures of Cornwall buildings instead of the one that, that we have in front of us, which is pictures of Grey Highlands buildings. Uh, it's very much up to date with what the act says. And um, there's a lot of hesitation about designation. And, and the question owners always ask, why would I do that? What's in it for me? So that is, is the focus to explain that, yes, there are restrictions, but there's a lot of advantages as well. Um, any comments or questions about the presentation? Any concerns? Okay, so uh, can we, I guess we vote to, we have accept to, we vote to accept it for information. <laughs> okay, all in favor. I'm not very good at this. This is not my, my, my shtick. Okay, so the, the second section is that the Museum and Heritage Com Committee approved the document in substantially the same form as, as the attached. Could I have a motion to that effect? Uh, Colleen, thank you. Seconded. Come on, Robert, put your hand up for something. <laughs> Robert, there, we got to get your name onto the agenda. Um, so all, all in favor. Of, sorry, uh, may we discuss? Oh, yeah, sorry. Any discussion of, of any changes that anyone thinks ought to be made? Thanks. I'm just wondering if we're moving to approve. Uh, approve for what purpose? Uh, well, to, you're, you're approving the content. And what I would like to, I, that would be made available to the general public. I've actually used the original of that was a public presentation at the local home show a couple of years ago. And the idea occurred to me at the time, it would be a good, um, it may actually at some point be posted on the provincial website. It's just a quick thumbnail sketch of what all the issues are, what the restrictions, what the, what the values and the, and the bonuses could be. Um, our municipal website at present, there's, if you've been on it, there's a section, it starts with a section of designated buildings and they're all listed. And there's a, a word document that explains the conditions of designation. What I would like to see is this um, uh, presentation be added into that section so that if an owner wants to know more about designation and what it means, that information is right there in the section with all of the designated buildings that are currently on our municipal register. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I, I guess my, my main intent here is to possibly amend the motion in order to just provide that as oh, and, oh, substance and for, of the oh, thing. And for, oh. and for public circulation by whatever means is deemed acceptable, something like that, yeah, that so, in the so motion. Perhaps, 
to approve for use on the municipal website and other heritage gray highlands. And, yeah, and for other public presentations. Okay, um, Amanda, can you fix that for us, <laughs> please? Yeah, that was my intention of bringing this forward anyway. Go ahead, Amanda. So um, we can either do an additional motion, uh, a motion to amend, or if the mover and seconder wish, we can just add that onto the motion as a friendly amendment. And just because it's a committee and we're being a little bit more flexible. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be up to Colleen and Robert if they wanna do that as a friendly amendment or do we wanna just do it as a separate amendment? Colleen says do it as a friendly amendment. And yeah. Robert, that's okay with you as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you're gonna add so now the motion is to the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee approve the document substantially the same form as attached here too, and uh, simply for the purposes of oh yeah posting okay, to like for, for, for the yeah for the purposes of uh, posting on the municipal website and in other public forums and used in other public forums is that fair enough. Gotta wait for Amanda to give me thumbs up that she's got that. I'll, I'll get you to read it back, Amanda, once you've got it drafted. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, that the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee approve the document in substantially the fo same form as attached here to for use on the Grey Highlands website and use by Heritage Grey Highlands. That suits me. Um, Okay, so uh, do the motion, the mover and the seconder approve the uh, redirected amendment? Yes, okay, all in favor of accepting? Thank you. Uh, th thanks uh, through the chair. Thanks uh, for a, a well done uh, a PowerPoint. Uh, I find it very interesting and, uh, and impressive. If I had a heritage house, I might be interested. Uh, it, it's, it's a real tight rope and I know Peter knows the same thing and there's all kinds of horror stories out there about and there's one going on right now in Collingwood some guy they know the 60s bungalow painted it but it was in the historic district and they're they're, they're going to make it they're finding him and they're making him take the paint off and and it, it's just it's heritage committees being their worst to make a bad public perception of heritage preservation so I'm taking that one to the uh uh, the CHO board later this week when I get the full story uh, from Collingwood. Anyway, so that's great. Um, the next item on the agenda doesn't require a motion. Um, the motion is, that I believe, for a discussion item, the motion is made at the end of whether we accept the discussion. And uh, the issue is the BIPOC, uh, BIPOC history which as everyone is aware is a big issue in the last couple of years. And Peter, I'm thrilled that you are doing what you're doing with black history and indigenous history in the museum. Um, in heritage, the, the, I sat for four days through a big webinar. And one of the main things that kept coming up, especially from BIPOC, BIPOC um, uh, participants, was that right now the, the history that we all know is the history of white colonialism. And the people that we celebrate are white colonial leaders and the buildings, the heritage buildings that we celebrate were inhabited by those same white colonial leaders. Um, and you know some of the points they made is black cemeteries in the States are paved over. Indigenous, well, we know where indigenous cemeteries are a disaster in this country right now. And, and I mean, there's nothing in a small community like Gray Highlands that we can actually do about that big history. But I, I would like some, you know, I just wanted to bring it forward for both the museum and the heritage committee, ways that we could be doing a better job. What the recommendation from the National Trust is, you're not gonna, you're not gonna eliminate, you're not gonna erase white history, it happened, but you need to add the black history and you need to add the indigenous portion and make it all part of the same whole so that we're sharing the history. And I just wonder if anybody has any ideas. I have no idea about outreaching to the local indigenous people. I thought maybe Mayor McQueen would know if 
the municipality or the county has a, do you have someone that you talk to um, in the indigenous community? Um, I guess it's Kate Croker would be the most, the closest. And this was their traditional land, the Ojibwe, the Nawash Ojibwe, this was their land. Um, is there anyone that you would recommend either Peter or me or both of us or, uh, or Michelle reach out, you know, like to, to get their cooperation and in including their story in the stories we're already telling. So I don't have that specific contact. No, can you hear me there? Can you hear me now? You can hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, when I was warden, um, as you know, it sort of went from into COVID and there would have been opportunity when I was warden to make some of those contacts, but then we sort of uh, lost that ability as we sort of you know, hunkered down on, on that kind of, but I would say reaching out to the county, I'm trying to think who you would, because I know the county has has a uh, dialogue with the, uh, you say Cape, Cape Croker and, and there is, uh, and I know from previous wardens, there was a relationship there as well. So I know the county has a connection and possibly even at this point, maybe even the warden, uh, Selwyn Hicks, who was in that uh, that, that, that that role before um, he was a, a term before me, he may have those contacts too. So I can give you the, I can I can forward you the warden's uh, be, number or name. Yeah, go ahead. It just shouldn't um, be me as a volunteer. Think, from the planning okay. department, I'm thinking more like Randy Switzer, at the county who deals with planning all the time probably has those contacts because part of your process through planning is to it, to um, to consult or to uh, to circulate. So I'm I'm thinking that the planning department would probably have those contacts. That would be Randy Randy Switzer and now Scott Taylor as well because Randy is now um, what's the term? He's sort of he's sort of the or second in in in, in the CAO, he's sort of—I forget the his his, his um, but he both Randy and Scott at the planning department would have those would have those contacts. Okay, and who would so be Scott Taylor and uh, Randy Switzer would would the and they so basically reaching out to the planning department at the county of Gray would have those because they because through planning for one thing you would and and certainly uh, also probably maybe the the clerk because now we. Um, uh, at the start of our county council, we also um, give address to the indigenous and who came here before us, and, and we do that as well. So I know even the clerk would have reached out and had those conversations as well. So, um, but the county of Ray being and being, you know, with um, uh, the county being situated in Old Sound, they're a lot uh, closer, and their and their staff having that having that uh, um, dialogue now. A number of years ago, and, and Stuart will, will relate to this, back, uh, I'm going to say around 2000 and uh, maybe 14 or so, 2000, we, we, we were um, going through a process of consulting with the uh, Indigenous groups. And at that time, Dan um, uh, Best had made contacts and we had different groups come to our council. So Stuart, do you remember... Or maybe when you were warden, Stuart, did you have some contacts uh, with the Indigenous uh, communities in, in Gray County? Well, uh, not, not directly, but there was a very, very interesting uh, seminar where we met with all the Indigenous communities. Yep. Uh, and uh, that was a very, very welcoming uh, experience. Um, but in Gray Highlands, uh, when we uh, wanted to get approval for the Markdale uh, Water Tower and etc., uh, we worked with and got approval through Soggy No Ojibwe Office, which is up in Cape Croker or, or in Owen Sound. So they are the ones that seem to be uh, looking after this area. And uh, when uh, I have some history, also when the industrial wind turbines were doing investigations uh, in this area, uh, they investigated, I think at one case, I, I, there was 14 different uh, inputs, uh, including the Métis, et cetera, that they talked to about the land where they were wanting to put up the wind turbine. So again, I have all that information stacked away somewhere in my car archive. So there's there's a lot of history there. Michelle? Thank you, Nancy. Um, 
I can certainly provide Peter with the contacts from the staff level. So the people at the county, I can put them in touch. I recognize that, you know, you're a volunteer. It's not your job to do our job for us. So um, I've got all of those county contacts and I will we'll start doing some digging. I certainly know that Peter, and I think you saw it in his presentation, we've already had chats about that, that he wants to start to recognize the history. So I, th I suspect this is a path we will need to be doing some investigating on anyway, and we can certainly pass that along and make sure you're um, we get the right contacts there. Okay, Emma. Oh, I'm on mute. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> in the last year, actually, just before the COVID-19 pandemic began, I had occasion to connect with the economic development officer in Saugeen First Nation over in Southampton. His name's Brad Ritchie. Uh, and I can share a contact information if that would be helpful. Uh, not necessarily connected to arts uh, and culture and history, but he might know uh, precisely who might be able to provide this kind of input. Uh, but broader than that, just in terms of considering uh, how we might approach this in terms of acknowledging that history, uh, my sort of recommendation would be to focus on starting with uh, the history of the treaty to which we're all currently and still yeah. uh, beholden, uh, which is to say Treaty 18. Um, and so, uh, and reflecting on sort of how that could be a moment where some of the, um, the potential sort of the, the colonial trauma that may have begun uh, in terms of sort of how to document that type of truth, um, that becomes a question for uh, the, longer and broader discussion we have to have as a culture uh, in order to ascertain the, the facts of that truth through stories as Peter, I think, has. Uh, what just occurred to me is, uh, sorry, what just occurred to me is maybe uh, Grey Roots would be a good place to start on behalf of the county as a whole. And, and I, my concern, I, I appreciate Paul's suggestion that we go through a planner, but planning has to do with land use. History and museum has to do with storytelling. It has to do with, okay, if we're writing a story about a farm in Kimberley, for example, you know, underneath Old Baldy, how do we add the fact that that was a very important um, Aboriginal hunting ground and fishing ground, um, and they didn't you know, they, they kind of camped in the area. They didn't really live here permanently, but they would move around and camp and grow some three sisters crops here and there at, at that time of year. Uh, so adding that story, you know, and we're not professional historians, but we sort of, you know, I really just wanted this to, I just wanted this to get on the table. And I'm so glad that the museum's thinking about it. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, so what I've uh, started to do is through Heritage Canada and Indigenous Affairs, uh, my brother-in-law is the director uh, in Ottawa. And so that's my starting point because uh, it can filter down. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to try to interpret an Indigenous story through my eyes. I want that story told through through their lips. So um, I think I say we do it correctly and, and start in the right place and don't touch that story. Put it up. People can push against it. People can twist it or fight it. But we have to start somewhere. And I think by starting with facts, or at least someone's perceived facts through story, through family, uh, heritage, that's the best place to start, uh, as opposed to just reading her you know, history books and, and then trying to interpret on our own. Um, so I'm going to reach out at least to see if he can give us a direction to this level on who we should be approaching and, and talking to. But I'm open for anybody, um, you know, uh, Emmett has some names, which it's a great place to start. So uh, I'm open for that, but I think it has to come from the right source, obviously. Yeah, and the thing about talking about planning and stuff, that the great county, and I know <laughs> Mayor McQueen is more than aware of how this, because he's been one of my emissaries over in the past. Great county doesn't have a very, strong record of heritage preservation you know the last time we asked them to create a heritage policy they said oh well you know only four of the nine municipalities even have a heritage committee and you know that we sort of need to be pushing harder on that as well but adding this to it. Emma you had another comment 
Yes, just uh, further to, to Peter's point about the idea of uh, trying to create spaces for uh, Indigenous history to be told through Indigenous voices. Uh, I recall during uh, celebrations for the sesquicentennial, there were there was a speaker who came a couple of times to Kimberly Hall to uh, describe that history uh, in a way that was uh, quite enlightening. Uh, my understanding is that he is uh, not directly connected to uh, necessarily the Saugeen First Nation. And so I think it, it's, while they are a sort of convenient and local um, sort of rights holder in this, uh, in this treaty, of course, uh, there is also the fact of the, the broader um, indigenous experience that might not be so strongly linked to the uh, actual reservation system, uh, which is to say trying to create spaces for uh, the diversity of indigenous voices so that we don't end up in the situation of uh, trying to create or uh, yeah, creating a monolith that doesn't uh, in fact exist. So uh, yeah, going back and, and sort of consulting with uh, the gentleman who did come and speak uh, might be a good way to, to go as well. Excellent. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna suggest everybody that's got ideas on this and I know Michelle's going to reach out as well. Uh, but um, maybe Emmett, if you reach out to the people you source. Keeping this back uh, to our next session with um, uh, more ideas uh, and, you know, and anything that, that Peter should know should go that way. And um, what I will do for heritage, I, I don't right now have anything that is, would be involved in this, but if something comes up and it is, there is an indigenous factor, um, I'll get in touch with Peter and get some guidance as to what he thinks I should do going forward with that section of the, of the, uh, of the storytelling. Um, any other comments on that? So I need guidance from Amanda, what kind of emotion do I need now? <laughs> now that our discussion is over. <laughs> Again, just to receive the discussion for information is all we need. And for and for uh, tentative action, would we do that? Or for, for the suggested actions? Because there were some outreaches suggested by various people. So do we receive the discussion? We cannot, as a, um, as a group, assign tasks to people. Um, if people got ideas and want to reach out and want to report back to, say, um, our curator or to our um, economic development uh, director, they can do that, but we can't assign those tasks. Um, okay, so should, just before we, we finish this discussion, then should it be understood by all of us if we're going to be doing any reach out in this issue that we reach out to both um, Michelle and Peter, copy them both on anything that we've discovered and between them, because they, they're, we, I know they talk regularly, they can decide what action would be appropriate for whatever we've um, uh, dug up. What do you think? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Well, if there's no further comments, I guess we just need a motion to accept this discussion um, for information. So moved. Okay. Uh, that's for Anna. Does seconded. Uh, Stuart, thank you. All in favor? Thank you. The rest, the rest of this should be pretty fast uh, because it's just accepting information. Um, Item 6.4, the Markdale 11 by 17 heritage window signs. Now that was not attached, Amanda, but it should probably be attached to the final uh, minutes that the Museum and Heritage Committee received the Markdale 11 by 17 heritage signs for information. What it is, it's another 13 signs like the 12 that are already out in windows through the community. Um, and some of those, Peter, might be uh, breadcrumbs you would, um, I'll make sure you get the whole collection. The, the, uh, and they might be things that you might want to build on or pursue for your storytelling. I would say the only comment I have about the ones I've seen is uh, because of its location, it's in a, it's in a window. Uh, 
boy, they are already look sometimes beaten and, and, and mm -hmm. abused. So yeah. uh, it's all about cardstock. It, thicker, healthier cardstock is going to help longevity for those. Yeah. Um, because, you know, if you're going to give them out and you're going to trust people to display them <laughs> with, uh, oh, you have a dog in the background. I hope that goes on the record. That's great. But um, I, I just think they need to be as beautiful as they can possibly be. You just don't want somebody to leave something out that's starting to shrivel or turn or bend. Uh, it just detracts from the message and the story. So. And that was sort of what I could get locally and the other, the initiative, and this was prior to your time, it, it was something that Robert E. Anterno uh, and, and Michelle loved it. The idea being that they don't cost a huge amount of money. So you get a lot of them and then, you know, going forward, I think they're about $3 each. And the idea was to have about 50 of them to, you know, create interest and then go forward. Michelle? Uh, Peter and I did chat about this the other day as well, and, and I agree. We want them to have some longevity, put a lot of work into these, and there's good information there. Um, maybe Peter and I can chit-chat about that. I know we're it was trying to be frugal, but, you know, we also don't want them to look like crap either after a while. So, you know, whether it's, do we look at a laminating machine? We do have a laminator at the office. Is that a way to protect them? And maybe Peter and I can come back with some suggestions and poten potential costs. The good news is we have the artwork now, Nancy, you've done it. So we can always repl replicate them in whatever form makes sense as part of, and I think this was a great way to test the market. We saw the receptivity of the property owners and now let's really get a lot of bang for a buck out of these. I did actually put in a print run for those next 13 because that was the last agreed yep. thing. Uh, but I did, po I pointed out to Fraser too, my concern that they were bent, like they came curved like that. And I asked him if there was a way because they are on high quality cardstock and they are laminated, but for some reason they curve. And I brought up, if he hasn't printed them, I can hold them if you want. Or the other option I have is I can get them to, to Peter uh, and, you know, he can look at them and see, or to you, and you can look at them and see if you think there's a way you could reinforce them that would make them better. And maybe we don't want them in windows anymore. I don't know. That that was just during the pandemic, the idea of creating interest. Yeah, and I think they're good. At, like, I like them in windows. I think that's a good it is that, you know, the breadcrumbing concept. Um, I think if you've got 13 of them at three bucks, now let's get those done. Let's have a look at them. And then we'll figure out for the next incarnation or the next batch we do, it'll give us a chance to look at how we move that project forward and really take advantage of it. And at the number 13, by all means, if you get them in, give them to me and we'll double up the card at the box. Literally when you put um, a, a cardboard uh, easel back on it. It gives it a rigidity through the spine that helps it from curving. There's lots of things we can do at 13. It's, you know, it, that's a no brainer. So I'll help you in any way I can. Well, and, and down the road, I mean, I can get the original 12 reprinted and replaced too. And some of them sort of went missing and don't ask me why that was a long story. <laughs> During COVID, it was really hard to not, and it was amazing how many people, oh, I don't want that. I'm not interested. Oh, no, I don't put junk like that in my windows. I'm thinking, what? You know, so anyway. Okay, well, the, the next 13 should be available shortly, and um, I'll bring them to you, Peter, before we uh, work on getting them out, and thank you for support. Okay, so I guess, do, can we approve that that has been accepted for information? Yeah, we had a motion to that effect. So can we have that approved that those are accepted for information? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Nancy, to interrupt. Um, we didn't have a mover and a seconder for that oh, motion. So okay. if we could start at that, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, could I have a motion that the 11 by 17, you know what they are, Heritage uh, uh, signs uh, be accepted for information? Uh, Mayor McQueen, uh, seconded by uh, Colleen Boer, and all in favor? Yeah, I just would like to support council because I think they may be interested in seeing that information because it's little bits and pieces that are of interest to people. Um, item 6.5 that the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee can sit, receive the updated Maxwell Church PDF for information. Could I have a motion for that? Uh, from Emmett, seconded by Stewart. 
Uh, the reason I included this, this is just so that the MHAC is, is aware of HGH protocols and procedures. The church was originally listed to the uh, register, but then recently, as you all know, because you were involved in helping approve it, it, it was designated. That meant changing the information on the website to include the designation by law, because by law that has to be part of the municipal register for the property. And it updated a little bit some of the changes to the property. And for Maxwell Church, this is one of the things we're doing. And Peter, you talk about heritage and, and storytelling, creating business. This building is um, an Airbnb now, and it is um, going to be available for like wedding ceremonies or anniversary celebrations. So her, and we're doing this with all of the commercial heritage properties attached to the PDF information are links to their website, which sort of we're promoting heritage, but we're helping the heritage property owners promote their business through our Any other comments or questions? Okay, all in favor of accepting that for information. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we are at um, that the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee received staff report MHAT 2001 for the information and that the Museum and Heritage Advisory Committee proceed with the 2022 meeting schedule on the third Thursday in February, May, and August at 1 p.m. May I have a motion? Thank you, Mayor McQueen, seconded by Emma. Um, as far as discussion, you have, discussion, a, comment? Uh, you have I, a comment? I yes, I do have a conflict at one o'clock. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, on, 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 oh, every Thursday is a conflict at one o'clock? Well, on the 17th and and my conflict is as a Niagara Escarpment Commission. And uh, next year we're going back into person, personal. So I won't, like right now I have yeah. an Niagara Escarpment, but it's on Zoom. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just, it, it is an issue with me at one o'clock on those dates. Uh, you said 17th and is it August? What's the August date? I got to go back here. Yeah. No, you know what? If we're going to change it, it needs to be a, with those. That date was chosen because the, uh, Thursdays were the original meeting day of the museum board, right, Colleen? And that's why we did it. And then you could have your meeting afterwards. Go ahead, Colleen. No, you're, you're unmute. Yeah. I'm, I'm unmuting. Uh, yeah, today we had our uh, museum board meeting from 10 until noon because of the MHAC meeting at 1. And uh, at least one of our members said she would like to go back to the 2 p.m. in the afternoon meeting. And I said, well, I can't really do MHAC and then the museum board meeting because the, the MHAC meeting in theory was to run for one hour from one until two. And then the museum board meeting was to be from two until four. It hasn't worked out that way. So I've asked my board to kind of meet from 10 till noon on the third Thursday quarterly. Not everybody's happy about that. So I'd be happy to change the time as well. Whatever anybody else would suggest, the, the one hour length of the meeting, like we're already five minutes over today. Yeah. So it, it and only because of discussions and I don't want to rush through the MHAC business. So yeah, I'm open for discussion as to timing. Well, so, so am I, and to be honest, this, is, this has never been a convenient time for me. I give up another commitment every time there's one of these meetings. So we need to pick another, either another date or another time. I'm good with that. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask um, Amanda, would it be appropriate to pull the entire committee in terms of a better, um, a better time for these meetings? And I know that Wednesdays are out because it's usually council or it's, you know, whatever. Um, what about later after you well, you go from two to four. No, we don't want to start having meetings, especially once they're in person. Nobody wants to be out in the dark after after that. Um, Amanda? Um, just, I have to work around other uh, committee meeting schedules as well. So we have to 
take into consideration all that, but I also have to have a motion moving forward going into 2022 saying what our meeting schedule will be. So uh, to pull all the members at a later date is not going to allow me to do that. This is where things get a little tricky with timing. Um, so I can suggest that if th the third Thursday of each month does not work for the committee, I do have uh, like the second Thursday or possibly the fourth Thursday of months that would also work for committees if that works for people's schedule. And timing could be mornings, afternoons. Um, at this point, that is fairly flexible as a starting point. I'm good with a different Thursday. How about uh, you, Mayor McQueen? Mayor McQueen? So County Council is usually the second and fourth Thursdays at, at Prairie County Council. I'm just trying to think, I can't go onto my device right now to see what, um, to see what uh, um, the first Thursday, I'm trying to think, the first Thursday of the month um, may be okay, but then maybe Thursdays don't work as, as well. And I, I'm thinking, uh, we at council were doing, uh, we had the first and third council, first and third Wednesday, and then we were doing the fourth Wednesday for Committee of the Whole. A couple times we did do a Committee of the Whole on the second, but I think it became fairly busy. So I don't know if the second Wednesday is a time slot that Amanda could possibly, I don't know if Wednesdays work or whatever, but uh, um, I, I know on my schedules, usually Mondays and Fridays are, are much better than Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, <laughs> just because it just seems to be that seems to be the core of that week, right? Um, but I, you know, I, 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 it's not all about me, and it just I, I do want to continue to be able to, to be a part of your uh, group, but just I do have those conflicts. That's that's all. Well, I think it's important for at least one member of council to be here because often what everything that we talk about is going to council, yeah. so it's somebody, somebody from council to be able. to Right. I think we kind of need to find some a slot where um, Mayor McQueen can attend. And I am thrilled to be on here. <laughs> we're back. <laughs> hey, we're happy to have you, kiddo. Uh, Amanda, what 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 do Wednesdays? The second Wednesday of the month does that look open for anything or Wednesdays? I don't see that there would be any conflict um, on Wednesdays on the second Wednesday of the month. So does um, that work for the majority of membership? Just maybe a show of hands at one o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Just as it works for me. I can manage the second Wednesday of the month. Okay. And it would be the same month of, you know, there's like February, the same three months. Is that Michelle? What do you think? Is it okay? With it, you? We're just conf we're confirming the, the morning of the Wednesday, correct? Not at one o'clock. Oh, because one okay. o'clock. Or, or can we do one, Amanda? I just need to check my calendar. Not that you care about me. It's not really important, particularly. Yes, it is. You are very valuable today. I walk my dog. I the... don't. No? Okay, Sorry, go. Chair. Um, I don't see any conflicts either morning or afternoon um, because council went ahead with a meeting schedule of the first and third and the fourth for committee of the whole. It would limit council's options, I guess, moving forward to additional committee of the whole meetings, that would be like, that would be the only concern. But, but with all due respect, that limitation is only one Wednesday out of three that that limitation exists. And perhaps that can be, a, a, you know, overcome in order to accommodate this committee meeting efficiently. Elizabeth, is a, a, a second Wednesday of the month okay with you? Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no. And Amanda, I think if you do it in the afternoon, generally committees as the whole, they try to hold them in the morning if we need to. So then if we did ours for the afternoon, we'd probably be okay in case that fourth Wednesday was required by council. Okay. Yeah, and maybe if there is a committee of whole in the morning, with, with because because we communicate by email, if we need to defer this meeting to 1.30 for exceptional circumstances, that could happen, I, I think, you know, anyway. Okay, so we need to, I guess we need to reword that in, do we need a new motion that says uh, on the second? Madam Wednesday? Chair? Yes? We have a motion on the floor right now. If we could just vote, and if we vote to lose this motion, we can put a new motion on the floor. Okay. As the mover or seconder, I'd simply like to 
change the motion to be second Wednesday. I don't know if my compatriot is, oh, I think, yeah, Mayor Queen. Yeah, Mayor Queen. It, makes it, yeah it makes it easy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just changed instead of the third Thursday, it's just the second Wednesday in those three months and we're all set. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Can we do that, Amanda? Was that a friendly change or something you called it? <laughs> sure. Good. Chris. Because technically, I was putting my hand up to to speak to that before I moved it, but you caught me as moving it. <laughs> well, no, no, and then it makes me move it, and then you speak it, and then you change it. Those are the rules. As I as I'm yeah. learning slowly, oh, no. yeah. And I hope you're paying attention, Colleen, because starting in February, this is your job. <laughs> I know. Um, okay, so all in favor of approving the schedule for the second Wednesday of the three months as listed. Okay, that mm -hmm. has been in approved. favor. Okay, I just want one last comment, just so both Colleen and I, so everybody's aware, the Museum Committee and the Heritage Committee are subcommittees of MHAC. So although MHAC will not be meeting in November and will not meet again until the new council has assembled and appoints committees, as subcommittees, we each continue with our normal role, you running the museum and me managing whatever heritage inquiries and work needs to be done um, and if there's some kind of an emergency that needs to have an emergency impact meeting then Amanda says we, we can probably manage that if it's serious enough to, to get that um, get that going and that's just so everybody understands we don't we don't get six months off while council get what gets elected <laughs> um, okay uh, item seven is members privilege uh, which means anybody who is um, at the meeting and has a separate item they wish to bring up, they bring up. Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah, I was scrolling through my uh, Twitter feed today and I noticed that the uh, city of Barrie, which has a new logo, by the way, help uh, as past is promoting to help recognize buildings, citizens who enrich Barry's history. Mm -hmm. I thought it might be something that we could put in a future um, slot, you know, but to consider uh, recognizing building citizens who enrich, Bear, uh, you know, Gray Highlands history might be something that we could think about because we really don't have any, uh, we, we have uh, awards from the, from the chamber, but we don't have a, a heritage award. So I'm thinking I'd just like to have that in place uh, for future consideration. Okay, um, and maybe it's something, um, especially if it's buildings and history, that's sort of more up my alley than um, probably. Well, citizens are attached to buildings too. Yeah, well, they're attached well, to the museum too, yeah. But the, you know, most of the buildings are attached. To anyhow, I, I, I'm bringing it up. I would like it in the minutes that we talked about it and that, uh, um, that we consider it in the future. Uh, our future deliberations, not do you, today. Do you want to make a motion that um, for oh, future sure. consideration? Okay. So, uh, how do you want? Do you want to phrase the motion? A motion that um, the members of the MHAC right. and its and its subcommittees will cons, uh, will um, examine the potential for having. Heritage awards for heritage buildings and for um, citizens. historic citizens hmm? and citizens. They don't have to be. Yeah, yeah. I kind of like the idea. They they do do it. So okay, so I'm making that motion, and I'm looking for a second or this. I'm not allowed to second it. Um, uh, Colleen. Okay. Oh, I'm, I don't know. Um, any dis any discussion of that idea going forward? Something else for us all to think about over Christmas, I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, all in favor of uh, us uh, proceeding with that uh, initiative at a future date? Excellent. Uh, are there any other uh, items of member Elizabeth? Oh. No. oh, that was just a yes, okay. <laughs> uh, are there any other issues that anyone on the committee wishes to bring forward under members' privilege? Okay. 
having said that, I guess item eight is next meeting, only that will be February the 16th at one o'clock, correct? Because of the uh, change of dates? Ninth, I believe. Oh, no, not the 16th, sorry. The, the third, the second Wednesday, I, here, I've got a calendar here. The second Wednesday of February would be February the 9th. So can we just change that, uh, Amanda, as a housekeeping item, or do we have to make a special motion? It will reflect the 9th on the minutes. Okay, that's great. That's all we need to know. Um, if there's no further business, may I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Move to adjourn. <laughs> okay, the Mayor McQueen, um, yeah, he can go back to his other meeting. Emma, all in favor, I guess that was unanimous too. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. And Peter, all the best going forward. I'm just in, totally in love with everything you're doing. Mm. Can I be president of, your, of the museum fan club? You know what, Peter, I know the Friends of the Museum, that was one thing I wanted to ask. Can you add me to the Friends of the Museum thing for updates so that, you know, if there's anything I happen to know that can help whatever's going on, 